we all like to think we look at scientific evidence with cold, hard objectivity, putting our own biases to one side. But this idea has been debated for many years. Scientists spend huge amounts of time considering the question of subjectivity when interpreting evidence. In normal times, it's a cornerstone of how science is appraised. But in these abnormal times, it's that same questioning still happening. So how healthy has our scientific debate been? Has it acknowledged what we just don't know? And has it given full weight, not just to COVID, but to the consequences of COVID? Throughout the pandemic, I have spoken to clinicians, academics and public health doctors who cannot speak because their employers won't allow it. I've spoken to others who have been disciplined for speaking publicly. And yet there are others who have genuine expertise but are reluctant to share their thoughts because they're too scared. The majority of us are conducting 40 to 60 consultations every day. This is and Professor Claire Gerarda, former system. elected leader of the country's GPs. I felt hot. I took my temperature and it was about 101, 102. Talking about her own experience of COVID back in March. She was happy to publicly discuss aspects of COVID then, but is now very reluctant. She says because the debate has become far too toxic. It's very difficult to discuss COVID. I mean, clearly everybody's discussing COVID, but it's difficult to discuss the nuances of the approach to COVID. What you actually have to do is to discuss, debate, look at options, weigh up the evidence, and then for our politicians to come to the right decision for the right, uh, for the right number of people. But even saying that, one gets accused of wanting to kill people, of uh, not wanting to save lives, which is nonsense. Dr Sunil Bhopal is a paediatrician. So I started in uh, March 2020 thinking, OK, we're going into this really severe uh, period where we need to throw everything we have at COVID-19, um, which needed to be done. It was absolutely the right thing to do at the time. But when Dr Bhopal argued back in April that children were at very low risk from COVID itself, but risked significant harm from COVID restrictions, he faced a furious backlash from some. Accusations have been thrown at me online, which don't know how much attention I need to pay to them. But my number one priority throughout and has been about health. And well-being. The debate around lockdown and shielding has been high profile and toxic but it goes well beyond that. There's been significant disagreements about issues such as how the virus passes between us, how many of us are immune, the wisdom of mass testing, how well masks work, whether we can eliminate the virus and that question about the closure of schools to stop the spread. Professor Sam Everington has been a GP in the deprived Bromley by Bow area of East London for over 30 years. I think the polarisation is partly because nobody knows the exact answer. You know what I mean? Mm. And it's really important to say that. We, can say, we, we need to be able to say, in, in science, you know where you are now, you know what the evidence is now, but we learn and you need, to, you need to change your approach as you go through. So there's always a level of uncertainty. And some people think that we have the answers to people's disease. And one of the important things I say to the patient quite often is, is I don't know. Some commentators argue that the debate has been dominated by those who have allowed least room for uncertainty. A footnote in a recent medical journal editorial provoked quite a storm in academic circles recently. Why? Because on the question of conflicts of interest, it said the authors declare that all three authors have been wrong about COVID-19. In an article about how little we really know about COVID, their point was very deliberate. Professor George Davy Smith was one of the authors. During the pandemic, I think the acknowledgement of uncertainty in communication of what is essentially scientific evidence, scientific knowledge, has been inadequate. There's some commentators who say have been saying exactly the same thing right from the beginning and they're carrying on saying that now. Whatever side of the debate they are on, they're not the people that I would aim to listen to to get useful evidence. But if the evidence is so uncertain, then why do many commentators seem so certain? Remember, scientists are always human and they will still, I do think, take a position that will not just depend on 
the evidence they have in the paper they've just written, other, th other their values will come into it as well. And we can see that it's rather obvious that that's coming to the fore, not just the data. Perhaps it was no surprise that something as enormous as COVID was communicated to people in broad strokes. Has normal scientific nuance been lost? And the problem with the way that we've communicated this, partly because it's politicised, is we've tried to come up with simplistic certainties which have proved to be far too simplistic and we've divided the entire scientific community into particular simplistic camps where they're absolutely definite that one course of action is right. And science just doesn't work like that. The honest answer is we really do not know how this is going to turn out. Talk to hospital doctors and many will tell you how concerned they are about the impact of COVID on the NHS and its ability to cope. Those warnings cannot be ignored. But do we risk not paying enough attention to other impacts? SAGE have in fact modelled the impact of the other harms and in official press conferences they have had some attention. The idea we can do this uh, without causing harm is an illusion. But it is case rates, hospitalisations and deaths that get primary billing. Although it's easy, in a sense, to count the deaths from COVID and count the hospitalisations. We should be always trying to measure the what else is going on in society in terms of mental health, in terms of, you know, like, again, life satisfaction, in terms of fa abuse, family breakup, and so on. The first of the World Health Organization's guiding principles says health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Recent figures from the Office for National Statistics suggest that in Britain things are not looking good. This graph shows how people respond when asked how satisfied they currently are with their life. The blue dotted line is just pre-pandemic. We can see that the latest restrictions have coincided with a massive fall in life satisfaction. It's now at its lowest ever level. Daisy Fancourt is also looking at the impact of the pandemic. She leads the COVID-19 social study, an ongoing study of over 70,000 adults. A lot of people are starting to find the mental health toll of this building up again now as we're starting to go back into more restrictions. We found that mental health improved over the summer, but it started to take a downwards trajectory over the last few weeks. I think it's critical that we do talk about how people are experiencing this more broadly. So things like whether people are finding it difficult, their mental health, particularly talking more about the inequalities of this pandemic, psychologically and socially, as well as in terms of the transmission of the virus. With governments everywhere having finite money, it is common practice to evaluate what spending brings maximum health benefits. Not doing so means things that should get funding could miss out. Department of Health guidelines say for every 20 to £30,000 spent on medical treatments, it should bring at least one year's worth of good health. Other government departments, such as the Department for Transport, take a different approach. They calculate that safety interventions can broadly be valued at something in the region of £2 million for the saving of a life. But we aren't necessarily doing the same for COVID. The trade-offs that we are making uh, need to be made more explicit so that we can, so that we can have informed conversations that are not polarised between pro and anti-lockdown. That that's not helpful. There's a moral case for examining how we use our public resources to best effect. We're moving perhaps from a, a, a period of emergency response to a, to a, a, a more an ongoing, a chronic situation of, of living with co the COVID virus. And that, I think, brings in health economics more clearly in terms of the need to evaluate the costs and benefits of different courses of action. Professor Sam Everington's experience in Tower Hamlets has led him to worry about an imbalance in our debate. It's always about COVID, COVID deaths, COVID cases. But actually my biggest worry as a GP is all the patients not coming forward with early cancer, heart disease. So one of the problems when you focus just on death and COVID numbers uh, all the time is you're creating mass fear actually rather than actually taking the approaches of about treating people as adults for a start um, but also um, making sure it's balanced 
despite there being a range of experts from across science who are consulted by the government's scientific advisory group for emergencies, some believe the focus has been too much on medicine and not enough on broader society. There hasn't been much diversity of thought. But the reason for that was that when this began, you have relatively small committees interested in a particular thing who normally don't get much attention, uh, interested in viruses and, and the spread of those. The group who are not included are people who study society as a whole and what actually matters to most people's lives in the round. So often with science, it's complex, nuanced and uncertain. The dangling of apparent certainty appeals because it helps make sense of what is happening. But how well has the media been able to grasp uncertainty? And if they haven't, how has this impacted on science? I think it must be a, quite a shock for the general public to see scientists disagreeing so vehemently with each other because the traditional view of science, uh, which I think is misguided, um, is that it's a sort of monolithic body of agreed facts. You know, and the media is responsible for this to a large extent by saying scientists say and ridiculous statements like that. But those of us you know, within, the, within science know that scientific communities are at each other hammer and tongues. What we're finding is that the fact that it's the most negatively associated with mental health is following the news on COVID. I think a lot of the media headlines are focused on COVID itself, but I think that might be part of the challenge for some people, is if they're not feeling particularly scared about the virus itself anymore, perhaps they're more concerned about the wider consequences the virus is having for their lives, then it could be that the headlines are not speaking to people in the way they were at the start of this pandemic. More families are going to lose loved ones before their time. It's now over eight months since the start of a pandemic that has changed everything, including for science. But with increasing evidence that our response to COVID has so many other impacts, are we allowing these to be captured and aired? I'm not quite clear where the balance lies between COVID-19 and uh, aspects of the COVID-19 response and I think that's a great uncertainty so what those of us in the scientific community in the pediatric and health community I think need to do is feel that we are able to raise these concerns raise these issues be taken seriously. Each day the science around COVID is becoming clearer but perhaps the biggest certainty of all is how much we still don't know.